Hello, Michael. Michael, hello. How nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you for meeting me in my favourite room in the world. One of my two. I'm Michael Palin, current member of this esteemed club since 2006. My name is Michael Wheeler. I've been a member of this wonderful club since 2004. Well, thanks a lot for joining me today. It's rather nice, Michael, to be sitting underneath this wonderful portrait of Darwin. I know, I know. I, I didn't know Darwin had ever been a bartender, but <laughs> there he is at home here. <laughs> he does yeah. look totally at home. Yes. And he's of, he's of real interest to you because of your, the work you've done on, on Hooker. John. Yes, I mean, I got to know about Joseph Hooker because I was asked to do a talk here. Yes, it's one of the yes. nice things about the club is that if you participate, someone will come along and say, what would you like to talk about or would you like to come along and, and um, you know, listen to a talk. So I gave a talk about Hooker and discovered not only a very esteemed member of the club, he was a great advocate of Darwin's work, but also he'd been on this ship called the Erebus. Um, when he was 21 years old. And that was a wonderful story, which I turned into a book. Yes, indeed. And nearly all the people involved, including uh, Sir John Franklin, who perished up in the ice in uh, the 1850s, were all members of this club. In fact, the I was, I was very interested in sort of geographical and travel sort of connection mm. with a club that mm. was a literary and scientific mm. club. I was amazed, actually, writing the book, how many travellers there were. But I was there when you gave that talk. And it, the letters between them were interesting. Yes. Right? Between Darwin and Hooker. Yes. Long, long letters. Yes. Detailed scientific letters. Well, I suppose they felt they were talking about important things, you know, the species so. and, and describing uh, something that had never been thoroughly described before. Yes. Yes. It's and, and I assume, you know, a lot of the work, well, not a lot of the work, but the discussions that went into the work might have might have happened here. Yes. Indeed in this in this very room. Yes. And I think there was a tremendous I think conversation between scientists. Mm. What it, one of the things that surprised me and interested me was that right from the start, it wasn't only scientists talking to scientists, but it was scientists mm. talking to bishop. Yes. Or bishop talking to architect. Yeah. And that's very important well, aspects of the club now, isn't it? I think so, you know, and I felt for a while, I was rather intimidated by by this club and clubs like it, just mm. because but this rather mm. particularly, um, because I felt it was fairly um, you know exclusive, sort of keeping people out. And of course, to a certain extent, it is. But what I found when I joined the club is that once you've joined, this is the most open place. It may seem a little closed from the outside, but when you're here, it's mm. it's, it's wide mm. open. Anyone mm. can talk to anybody, and I, 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 yes. as you rightly say. And Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, the founder, John Wilson Croker, back in 1824, yes. what he really wanted to do was encourage conversation between people who had different views. Mm. You know, the idea that here he was, a yes. high Tory, and making sure that the first members of mm. the committee, those were majority of Whigs. Mm. And that comes through today as well, I think, that you can have different views, yeah. but exchange them freely. Yeah. But was he? To, did he set up the club because he didn't? He wanted to avoid a specifically political arena. Yes, absolutely. Something outside Westminster. Mm. Absolutely. He had the idea that there were plenty of political clubs mm. and there were military clubs. Mm. But what about literary clubs? You know, mm. that, because there weren't any literary clubs really. Mm. And by literary, it's very broadly defined idea of the literary. Yes. And so artists and writers and scientists as well as the cabinet ministers, the judges, the bishops. Mm, mm. And the idea that it was non-partisan, but a fascinating mm. thing I found, and I, you feel that today as well. It wasn't based on your background, it was based on you and what you'd done in life and whether you were interesting, you were going to yeah. be interesting to other members in some way. Well, you, you, you had to have made a few friends, didn't you, in order to in have order enough to names, names in the book. Yes. Uh, to be elected, so yes. that's something. So, you, you know, get, again, it's quite a wide range of different people who perhaps help your election to the club. They had to. Yeah. And yes. it went to a thousand members in the first year, which is incredible. 
Right. Yes, and then the waiting yeah. list after that was 16 years yes. before you were put in the ballot. Oh dear. And then you might not get in. Exactly. <laughs> it's like being a member of Lords, isn't it? So I'm a member of the MCC. The MCC. People <laughs> die before they ever get elected. <laughs> yes, your, your, your membership's come through. I'm oh, sorry, he died last week. <laughs> <laughs> that happened. <laughs> But when you, when you were putting the book together, which I really think got, covers the ground so well, makes it so fascinating, but were you aware, as, as you're saying now, of comparing it to other clubs and, and always sort of having to um, estimate where the Athenaeum stood as opposed to other clubs at different times in its history? Yes, yes. I mean, it was actually, I was a member of the Oxford and Cambridge for 10 years. Yeah. And mm. then I moved to the Savile up the road mm. before I came here. Mm. And that turned out to be incredibly useful mm. because you could feel the difference, yes. you know. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And what I loved about this place, it, this was the right club for me. And obviously mm. you feel it's the, the right club for you. Yeah. For all the reasons you've said, really. Yeah, but, uh, uh, yes. And one, one sort of rather banal thing, but it's just it's so light. <laughs> and oh, there's so many clubs. I sort yes. of associate with dark rooms yes. and lamps going on at three in the afternoon, even during the yes. even during the summer. The wonderful thing about the rooms here, the, light. the drawing room upstairs, is just one of the most beautiful oh, rooms fabulous. In, in, in London because it's filled with light. It is, and I think that's sort of <laughs> a kind of a metaphor for uh, maybe the sort of intellectual um, um, sort of assumptions of the Athenaeum. Let, 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 let there be light. Let there be light. The light of reason. Yeah. Was there ever a time when the club you know, fell at fell on hard times well, and all the became clubs, unfashionable? All the clubs really had a big sagging time in the later 20th mm. century. And this club was reinvented in many ways. Mm. So in the last 25 years. Yeah. And I mean, in our time, because we've had women members, which has made a, a different, big difference mm. to the club. Mm. But the other thing you mentioned, events. Yeah. Talks, lectures, yeah. all kinds of events. Mm. Um, that's been a huge change. Mm. And so, you know, it's been using the principles of the club, but reinventing them. Yeah. What happened in the Second World War was that the club stayed open all the way through the war. Wow. Uh, the bombs kept wow. missing it, although there, there are, there were pop marks on, on the front from shrapnel. Mm. But in the club, there was a guy called Henry Tizard, who was put in charge of developing radar. Yeah. And there are a bunch of scientists were brought in here quietly to discuss all that, which is fascinating. What, there's also a tradition when the head of MI6 and the MI, head of MI5 were always members of the club. Yeah, and so you've got these people who they were automatically sort of well, not yes, automatically, they were in, but they, they, were, they would have felt left out if they weren't. Members they'd be of the upset. Club. Like Prime Ministers. Yes. Prime Ministers tend to be upset if they're not invited. It, yes, yeah. So anyway, there are the spy catchers. Mm. And what they hadn't realised is that uh, Kim Philby, whose father was a very famous man mm. and a member of the club, and Kim Philby was a gentleman, you know, mm. privately educated, Cambridge, all of that. And he was elected in his early 20s, and he came in here. And of course, what he was doing was picking up information all the time. Mm -hmm. And then after the war was mm. sending all these yeah. secrets to Moscow. Mm -hmm. And we know that story. What interested me was that there's a link between the radar story and the spy story. Because you know how during the Second World War, there's a whole network of radar stations around East Anglia in the southern coast, like a net. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that Kim Philby was a member here McLean was a member next door at the Travellers. Yes. Yeah. And Burgess, I found, was a member of the Reform. Yeah. Yes. Three of the Cambridge yeah. spies yes. spread out in clubland yes. like a net. I know, extraordinary. And meanwhile, the head of MI6 is having, having lunch here and yeah. having private <laughs> conversation. <laughs> So um, that, that was fascinating. We worry about Huawei, you know, <laughs> it was all homegrown. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was an interesting... That is, that is. ...discovery, that, really. Yeah, um, yes. And I suppose they were all, all of them, I mean, they were clubbable people. They liked being in clubs. They were probably, I mean, I don't know, very charming. 
Yes, yeah, a lovely person to spend an evening with talking about Palladian architecture well, or something like that. You've got to be charming to be and a spy. At the same time, you're yes. picking up all this yeah, bit yeah, of information all, from all yeah. the other members yes. who are in, in positions of influence and power. Well, mm. and the German embassy over the road. All right. Yeah. The ambassador was coming in here as an honorary member just before oh, the First World yeah. War with ears flapping. That is, yeah. As the generals and the admirals were having a little chat about how things might go. <laughs> you know, so, I mean. Yes. Yeah. There's wow. always a dark side. Yes, isn't there it? is, yes. Not exactly the finest hour, but that's the nature of the club, really. Of any yeah. club, I think. Yes, people who can talk and talk well gather together. Well, Michael, it's been really good to have a chat and, uh, you know, after I'd heard your talk and I'd written the book, it was just lovely to have a chance to talk about the book. Oh, well, it, it, the book is treasure trove. You've done a lot more work than I did for the hooker talk. 